Today is February 20th, 2024, and my guest is author and technology expert, Azim Azhar. He is the author of Exponential, Order and Chaos in an Age of Accelerating Technology, which is our general topic for today, along with what is coming next. His substack is Exponential View. Azim, welcome to EconTalk. Uh, Russ, it's really great to be on the show. Thank you. What is your background? What, are you, what have you done with uh, yourself besides write a book and... Uh, and uh, a, a very interesting substack. Yeah, you know, I'm just a really lucky creature of, of time uh, because I was born just as the microprocessor revolution took off in 1972. So as a child, I had a computer. We had a, a couple of computers by 1981 in the home. Uh, I always had them, uh, but my parents were economists and I ended up doing a social science degree, uh, which included uh, economics, but never leaving sight of my love of computing. And my career has been a bridge between those two worlds for the last 30 years. Uh, and so I've worked in the tech industry I know a little bit about economics, not as much as you, not as much as some of your guests, um, and I try to bring them together in my daily life. I hope your parents are okay with the fact that you've slipped into the, a more practical realm of life. I think they were quite happy when the, the book came out, and uh, it wasn't about building products. It was about you know, presenting ideas to the world. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your book to get yeah. started. It's called Exponential. Uh, yeah. Why? You know, what I had noticed uh, was that there were a load of technologies, several technologies that were improving um, at these double-digit exponential rates other than computers. I mean, we'd known about computers I improving uh, at this sort of 50 60% per annum rate because of this articulation of Moore's law. Uh, but it became clear to me by about 2014 or 2015 that we were seeing exponentials in other domains. Uh, so in the cost of lithium-ion batteries or the falling cost of solar panels. Uh, and as I started to look around, I found more and more of these uh, relationships that looked like Moore's Law relationships. Uh, and, and I wanted to understand them. And so I started to, to, to dig a bit deeper. Now, of course, you're an academic and I was writing a trade book. So there is always a, a little bit of um, art, artistry in connecting those ideas for a, a general audience. And I think, but I think the idea that, that we're in an age of exponential technologies where things get uh, cheaper by 10, 20, 40, 50% per annum on a compounded basis, and therefore they get deployed in our economies uh, at, at very, very high rates, um, is... is reasonably robust empirical uh, observation. We can see it across a, a, a lot of different technologies. And it's, you know, a dramatic example that which you, which you use and illustrate is the speed of adoption of various technologies, how long it takes um, a technology to reach a particular threshold of, of uh, market penetration. And it's faster today. <laughs> it is it is so much faster and it's perpetually out of date uh, because when I when I submitted the uh, the read the manuscript to the publishers TikTok wasn't a thing uh, and while I was writing the second draft TikTok had <laughs> gone past like a billion users faster than Facebook and and then of course since then we've seen uh, chat GPT get to 100 million users within a matter of a uh, you know a few days and that you know that there are some obvious reasons for that. Uh, the, the first is that you don't need to build out the infrastructure. We all have smartphones, we all have internet access, and that wasn't the case for Yahoo or Amazon back in the, the mid-90s. Uh, but there's, there's a second reason, uh, which is really to do with the, um, I think, our, our stance and willingness to, to explore Maybe not the entirely novel, but the incrementally new. You know, there are just mechanisms. Social media lets me find out about something far faster than I, I did previously. The idea that you psychologically might have fallen off the latest cool trend uh, drives people to uh, experiment with these things in ways that I didn't really see people dipping into the internet in, in the late 90s. And yes, yeah, so this idea of, of time compression uh, for adoption um, is very true on digital technologies. But Russ, I also think that it is true um, in, in physical uh, technologies. Because if we just look at this as an internet phenomenon, we ignore the fact that there's a lot of stuff going on in, in 
the back end in supply chains, in logistics, in marketing, that makes it much more efficient for markets to let a customer know about a product and then physically get that in their hands. And so we can look at something as as big and clunky as an electric vehicle, right? It weighs 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 pounds. And these things are flying off the shelves far faster than anyone had forecast. And, and the question is, you know, why, why is that? And part of it is to do with the same phenomenon that makes us all learn about chat GPT very quickly, right? It's social networks, the information spreads faster, firms are much more efficient. And, you know, at the heart of that, of course, remains information technology, right? IT. Uh, but we are at this, at this moment where it's not just the digital products. It is the big, heavy, physical ones uh, that, are, that are also being deployed in our economies uh, at rates that we haven't really seen before. And as you point out, uh, this is driven... Well, let's talk about... You mentioned Moore's Law in passing. Uh, for, for listeners who don't know what it is, explain what it is, and then talk about Wright's Law, W-R-I-G-H-T, yeah. Wright's Law, which uh, actually is more interesting. So uh, talk about both of those and what drives them. Yeah, you know, Moore's Law is uh, is the thing that has made the computer industry the big successful thing that it is uh, today. It was an observation by one of the founders of Intel uh, that we would be able to put more transistors on a single silicon wafer uh, at an increasing rate, roughly twice the density every couple of years. Um, and if you did that, you would get performance improvements. And as you point out, though, it's not a law like gravity. <clears throat> so what's causing that uh, phenomenon? It's slowed down a little bit in recent years, and it's caused some to wonder whether a quote will no, no longer holds. But it held quite remarkably with quite a bit of um, reliability for a very long time. Why? Why? You, so we, it was so reliable for six decades. And I think the beauty of it is that it was about... Um, collaboration, and it was about incentives. Uh, so you'll discover in our discussion that I'm a wishy-washy centrist. You know, I think there are <laughs> there are things on the on you know liberal ap- approaches and collaborative approaches and market approaches and communal approaches. They all have a, a part to play, and I think Moore's law was exactly that. So the the Moore's law articulated effectively a, a social contract um, across the the very big and increasingly complex semiconductor industry where people felt that they had to hit this clock speed of of the doubling and it required lots of um, uh, alignment in a way and, and, you know, individually developed R&D plans to dovetail to the results that we saw for for six decades. But at the heart of that was the economic incentive of a growing market and being able to sell more products at better margins. And at the very top of that uh, 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 pile was the relationship between Andy Grove and and, and Bill Gates, uh, which was um, what Andy giveth, Andy Grove from Intel, Bill taketh away that we, uh, in other words, every time Andy came up with a new processor with more processor cycles, Bill Gates would figure out how to use them for a new application, forcing Intel to do that again. But that process echoes all the way down the supply chain and that microeconomy that was the semiconductor industry. Um, And and so, in a way, some of the best analyses I've seen of it have been to say, this was as much about a sort of social belief that that emerged within the participants of this um, economy and these individual agents, these firms, worked to uh, d- d- deliver on it in a way that can only work in a market economy. Um, but it isn't a law of gravity. And that, I think, is the important uh, observation. Yeah, I, I don't know if, if you're right. I, th- I, th- I suspect you are. But I, what I like, what's fascinating about it is the idea that a, a cultural uh, norm, almost like a religious belief, uh, that, that people strove to fulfill it. That, that people made an effort, partly because they were afraid they'd be left behind, by the way, if it, if it was sustained. And, of course, that fear helped sustain the, that, that pace. Uh, now, talk about rights law. Yeah. So, rights law, I think, has got more of the attributes of um, a, a law that can be predicted. Um, and rights law ev- emerges in 1936 when Theodore Wright is an aircraft engineer um, and he is looking at um, how the unit cost of making an airplane, an airframe, would decline 
as the engineers acquired more knowledge. Um, and, and, you know, other economists, Marshall, I think, had, had said this, you know, 50 years ago, but hadn't got the empirical data to back it up. Um, and, and essentially what, what Wright said was that for every doubling in cumulative production, the per unit cost would decline, uh, in this case, by about 15% as a result of learning rates, right? So the compounding knowledge of the engineers figuring out which screws weren't needed and shaving off a little bit of the airframe here, being a bit more efficient with the process, reordering things, uh, delivered this learning benefit. And then it was revived in the 1960s by the Boston Consulting Group as the learning curve or sometimes the experience curve. And when we look at engineered products with, with many components, there should be a learning element to them. In other words, they're big and complex and clunky when we first build them. And as we get better and better, we're able to uh, you know, optimize that, um, that. Now, the thing about Wright's Law is that Wright's Law can be applied to the um, cost declines that we see in the semiconductor industry, and it ends up being more predictive than, than Moore's Law. Uh, but it also can be applied to other technologies, so solar panels, lithium-ion batteries, various types of other mechanical uh, processes. And, and the question is, you know, why, why does it come about? And, and I, th I, I think that it, it's easy to tell by way of a, a story. You know, during the COVID lockdowns, I started to, to bake, um, and and the first loaf of bread I baked was really expensive. I mean, I just wasted lots of flour and of the ingredients. By the time I got to my eighth loaf of bread, it was so much more uh, value, better value for money because I got better at what I was doing. And my processes were better. And that is at the heart of Wright's Law. And of course, the biggest cost of baking is your time. And right. I'm sure you got better at that. Uh, even though it's not out of pocket, it's the it, it's a, an expenditure you have to make. You know, it actually goes back before Marshall. It goes back to uh, a guy named Adam Smith. Well, right? of course, so Adam Smith, Smith. Right? Yeah. Smith writes that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, and it's a slightly it's a it's a nice phrase. Economists learn it at some point. Some do, and they can roll it off their tongue. But it it's more about um, it's as much about learning by doing, which is, mm -hmm. in other words, it's not just to the extent of the market, it's the extent of the process with that the individuals in the firm are using. And of course, he writes very eloquently in his very simplified and perhaps inaccurate, but still valuable story of the pin factory of how you get better. It's about learning by, do learning by doing. And it's phenomenal that that, process, that improvement, that better understanding that, you know, Smith has all these examples of the, the kid who's working on this process, figuring out how to do it a little bit better. And the idea is that if you're specializing in it, you get kind of focused on improving that process. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to work that way. It could work that if you specialize in it, you're bored and you, 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 drive, you get driven insane. And, uh, but in a mm -hmm. modern, complex engineering problem, the opportunity for those improvements, as you say, is is almost always there, and they they come about through experience. Uh, yeah. It's really uh, an an amazing thing. And the other part of it that that is so powerful, as you point out, they're also related to Smith is globalization. Mm -hmm. So at the same time that firms are expanding and and price is falling, which is increasing the quantity demanded of the product. Absolutely. In a world of globalization, that opportunity to expand the scope of, of market penetration and learn by doing as you expand and drive the price further via competition, right. as other firms are doing that, getting better, finding those improvements, it's a really beautiful uh, feedback loop that's, I think, not well understood by economists uh, or lay people because it's dynamic. It's not mm. uh, easily described in, say, a supply and demand picture. But it, 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 it really it is, is a beautiful it, thing. It, it's really dynamic. And I think there's something else that we can pick up on from learning by doing, which is that the idea of learning means that there is some knowledge which is likely to be in, intangible. Uh, and the ability for us to share that knowledge 
can expand the number of firms who are applying that knowledge and can contribute back into the rate of of learning. Um, and you know, a simple model would be that um, in, in you see this in Silicon Valley, um, in in you know, in California, where people leave firms regularly and they go from one to another and they take with them that tacit knowledge. Um, and you know, while it's harder to to work out the learning rate for a software product, um, you can you can see uh, analogously that there is a, an increased rate of learning because of that revolving door, um, and you can you can also see historically moments where we started to pool knowledge, we were able to drive. Uh, exceptional social outcomes in terms of driving prices down. And one of my favorite examples is uh, the, around the steelmaking process when you had this this period of time in the late 19th century of Bessemer collective in, invention, where the demand for, for steel, for the railroads and for industrialization was so great that the some of the steel manufacturers pooled their patents, their know-how together um, in order to share in a much larger uh, market. And I think inf information technology plays a role in accelerating learning rates because you all, we're much better at codifying that knowledge uh, and therefore using it within and across firms that are getting bigger and bigger. And, and, and I think you know what one of the things that I touch on in the book is how in computer science it started, but it's moved into other uh, disciplines. Academics now shortcut the very long peer review process, um, and they they preprint their information on something called archive. Now, in computer science, theory and practice are quite closely related, right? Because you just put the code in. But I think that it's really um, interesting to me that the period of time from an innovation uh, being sort of identified by academics and making its way into working code has really collapsed. So in the early, in the late 70s, um, some mathematicians, um, uh, Ron Rivest and uh, his colleagues, came up with an, an encryption algorithm called RSA. Um, and it was first published um, in sort of academia in the mid-70s, but it didn't make its way into mainstream consumer products for two decades. Um, and today what will happen is that uh, an academic, I, I've just, uh, before I spoke to you, spoken to one of the authors of the Transformer paper uh, in, from Google in 2017, the Transformer being the architecture that give, gives rise to large language models. And that paper was was written and published in 2017. We had the first products, uh, product, productizable products within a year. Um, and seven years on, you know, there's hundreds of millions of users and that's quite a long time frame compared to where we are with the spread of knowledge. So that isn't quite, that's not always learning by doing, Russ, but, it, but it, my, my observation is that learning by doing happens in a, in a distributed way. It happens within organizations. And because of IT, they're able to share that knowledge much more rapidly. And they're now moving into the this, 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 the next phase of this, which is to simulate the learning by doing. So there are many companies in physical engineering and manufacturing who instead of building 10,000 prototypes, each one better than the previous one, they model 10 million in a computer simulation and they get to a point of efficiency much, much more quickly. So their starting point is better. Now, what I don't know, and I would love to find research on this, is what that affects you, how that affects the ongoing learning rate, right? If you already start at a good, good place. But I, you know, one of the reasons I'm excited about where we stand is because once we see the value of economies of learning, not just economies of scale, once we start to do uh, acknowledge something that I think economists have known for such a long time, which is that technology is compounded knowledge. We we can find ourselves at a point where we can drive these social outcomes, which I mean in the pure economic sense, right? Welfare, prosperity, um, in ways that that are not left to you know the, the spirits of arbitrary decisions. And I think this insight that I that for, that was an insight for me and your peers had known for a long time about a decade ago has really electrified me about how I feel about the next. 20 or 30 years uh, and what it might mean for you know the state the state of humans and humanity. Well let's talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> Your book is uh in a sense out of date. It was written in 1921 which I mean 1921 2021, 2021. <laughs> feels Not like 1921 now. Yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was written two and a half or so years ago yeah. or published two and a half years ago. 
Um, for better or for worse, most of it hasn't changed at all. It, it <laughs> is, a, in that sense, a tragically timeless book in, in the following sense. There's two themes of the book. The first theme is that these technologies, both in the world of um, silicon and also in the world of physical processes, are speeding up. So you focus on uh, computing, uh, energy, biology, and manufacturing. Uh, I assume, I'll let you talk in a mm. sec, but I assume th all those trends have just continued. The second part of the book is our ability to cope with this change has, we haven't kept up. You call it the exponential gap. You talk about regulation, you talk about norms, legal systems like copyright, and you suggest lots of interesting ways that we might respond to this changing world we're in and how that world is, um, the world that we have of, of regulation, copyright, intellectual property, uh, and norms, or uh, institutions, and so on, isn't isn't keeping up. Uh, but not much has changed there. It, it seems right. to me that we've not made much progress at all in how to cope with this change. So let's start with first, have the trends that you wrote about continued to accelerate in those four areas? And then we'll talk about our lack of progress in coping with that. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, they've definitely, uh, we've seen an acceleration within computing and the, the, the world of AI. Uh, it, it's just, you know, hard to put words on um, what, what we've seen. And one thing to to look at is that the the firms that made make the largest capital uh, investments uh, every year now are the big tech firms like uh, TSMC in chips and Google and Amazon uh, and, and Microsoft. You know, it's no longer the oil industry and the oil industry is sort of a distant uh, second place uh, as industries go. Um, and it, we're also seeing it, of course, in terms of the way in which companies are spending money in, in that, that area. But, but I think one area that we, that I spent a bit of time on in the book and has deserves more attention is what's happening in um, in energy and you know w w what's happening in energy is that the price of uh, solar panels is coming down really really dramatically and uh, in fact i i had tracked a sort of 15 to 19 percent compound decline since 1970 uh, if you ever watch the james bond film there's a james bond film called the man with the golden gun which was all about stealing a, a solar piece of solar power technology you wouldn't do that now because it's so dirt cheap um, but you know in the last year uh, chinese manufacturers halved the price of uh solar panels or one of the components within solar panels. Uh, and so that's continuing. And I think it's worth thinking about how dramatic and radical that is in an economic context for our uh, economies. Um, you know, what you do when you are running off uh, solar power rather than off fossil fuels is that you're away from the commodity volatility. Your price of, of energy is not dependent on what the regional autocrat feels like on a given day. Um, you can make 20-year forecasts of what your price will be and, and every subsequent installation will be um, much, much cheaper. So you trade off uncertainty and volatility, which has all of these frictional costs um, that we, we have to you know, live with and, and contend with as the energy crisis of the last few years uh, has, has shown. Um, but the, you know, the other thing is that solar panels are a modular technology and a modular Modularity is a key part of um, taking advantage of Wrightian uh, economics because in modularity, your number of units produced is much, much larger than with these with monolithic systems. So you have more iterations of the learning rate because cumulative capacity is doubling faster. But modularity also hugely expands markets because 25 years ago, to become an energy producer, I would need a billion dollars, maybe $2 billion. Today, I need $5,000 and I can stick some panels on my roof and I can connect them up to the grid. And markets will then really um, expand rapidly. And we've already seen that. So one of the, uh, if you consider it as a, um, as an economy, China's rooftops, domestic rooftops, um, are the second largest provider of solar electricity anywhere in the world, right, compared to all the utility scale um, in other parts of the world. Um, and, and so I think 
understanding what's happening in solar um, really uh, is critical. And I'll just share with you a couple of you know d- data points. So um, the amount of new solar that we've added um, globally has increased by uh, on effectively 61% compounded since 2010. That is net new ads um, each year. And in 2022, global el- electricity uh, generating capacity was about nine terawatts across coal and nuclear and wind and solar and so on. Um, uh, Bloomberg has just forecasted forecast today that they think over the next seven years to the end of the decade, solar will add seven terawatts of new generating capacity. And Bloomberg's forecasts are always far short of what actually happens. And that's remarkable because that is because energy is wealth, right? The thing that that has transformed humanity from 9000 BC has been our ability to harness energy. And the fact that we can have an energy system that is affordable, predictable, um, and in a sense, uh, almost abundant, I mean, not no, you know, not literally abundant, um, has really significant implications. And I'm excited. I'll give you two economic implications, right? One is um, it means that energy independence is affordable for many more nations. But, uh, it, you know, it's not just the US and Saudi Arabia and Qatar who can, who can achieve this. Um, but the second is that it enables a local economic um, agency, local economic production. There's a fascinating battle going on in South Africa at the moment, which is, um, you know, full of brownouts because there's not enough generating capacity. But Cape Town has um, substantial renewable uh, resources because of of wind power. And ESCOM, the sort of national uh, body, has been really reluctant to allow Cape Town to access its own electricity resources because it it wants to spread that energy um, nationally. And the, the, the regulatory framework doesn't makes sense, right? Because you've got these local um, investments taking place. And I think this idea that decentralized, low-cost solar power um, can create much more local economic agency, create more economic principles, um, is a really, really exciting one. And what it means, especially in underdeveloped markets, um, I, I think is is you know yet to be fully thought through. Have we gotten better at storage? Slightly. The big question with wind and you know, there's wind and solar have two problems. <clears throat> They're not on 100. percent There's cloudy days and windless days, yeah. or days with much less wind, and then it's hard to store. Have we gotten better at that? We're, we're getting better at storage. Uh, we are, uh, you know, we have for the, you know short duration battery prices uh, have come down uh, really substantially over the last. Uh, 20 years. I mean, they, they were about over $1,000 uh, per, per kilowatt hour uh, a decade or so ago, and it's now approaching $100 per kilowatt hour. So it's becoming uh, more affordable. Um, and, th- you know, w- there is still a, an enormous gap um, in terms of medium duration storage and, and longer duration storage, both in terms of proven technologies, but also in you know, physical capacity that exists and investment that's going, going in there. But the the thing that i would i would say is that it that it's natural that the that storage will follow generation be, because the need doesn't emerge until until the need exists and and so i would expect storage to to follow up quite quickly and how that creates a patchwork of solutions is going to vary economy by economy in a country like the uk where uh, 25% of every car sold is an electric vehicle with 10 days worth of storage for a house <laughs> in the battery you you are you might be able to solve part of the storage problem through a decentralized solution like that um you, you know in other markets are incredibly energy poor like Tanzania or Kenya you, you know the amount of storage you need to keep a fridge running which transforms outcomes and to keep an irrigation system running is a few cheap lead acid batteries. Uh, and so we were able to move into this, this space of transforming people's lives uh, w- when we think of it from the bottom up rather than you know, the top down. God's plan would not be able to make sense of how we have to plan for storage. But I think that the market can, uh, can do that um, if, if the incentives are allowed to flow through to the innovators and to the entrepreneurs and to the business people. I mean, I think I think it can. 
Do you have an idea of what portion of solar energy is coming from rooftops versus solar farms? I mean, you mentioned the Chinese rooftops. After a while, there's you'll have a solar panel on every roof, possibly right. potentially. There's there's an there's sort of a limit. Now, now maybe there's not a limit for how it absorbs it. I don't know, but it is that. What's driving it? Is it rooftops getting solar panels or is it also solar farms? It's the beauty uh, of solar is that um, it's both. Uh, and I think the analogy to go back to is the is the microchip. Uh, so prior to the um, arrival of the microchip, computers were very, very big and they were only bought by large companies um, and they were in, this, uh, in rooms. And then as we started to miniaturize uh, the, the computer, it, uh, it, it uh, gave access to a whole new segment, um, which was corporates buying computers for their employees' desks. Um, and alongside, individuals could go off and buy the, buy the same. Um, and today, it effectively, no one buys mainframes. I mean, if you're going to buy, spend $100 million on computers for a data center, they're not too dissimilar than our laptops without a screen. Um, but what you're able to do is, is address a very, very broad market. And so what, what, which part of the computing industry is the most important when it comes to selling chips? Well, there's a, there's a bunch of quite large segments. And so, so I think how, the beauty of that is that a given economy can put in the right, the, the set of incentives that it feels are, are appropriate given its natural, uh, you know, wind and solar resources and whatever hydropower it's got and nuclear kicking around. Um, and and if, if it makes sense to incentivize homeowners um, to, to fill the gap, then you can do that. And if you want to incentivize building on brownfield, old industrial land for solar farms, you, you can do that. But you have you have the choice in a way that you didn't have the choice when it was really about building big nuclear power stations. And that was, you know, that was then all about where do you site them and which, who's going to be willing to have it in their backyard. And, and I think that, that that creates, I think, um, a much better stand, uh, uh, starting position for you know, the, the, the marvels of economics and incentives to play their role. Let's turn to computing. Mm. Uh, you have an essay on your uh, Substack about just how much computing we're going to need in the next 10, 20, 30 years. It's yeah. unimaginably large. So talk about why that's the case, first of all, and then I want to turn to to AI. So first talk about just the demands for computing power that are that are coming. Yeah. Well, t yeah, today's demands for computing are, uh, you know, visibly coming from uh, AI systems that need, uh, you know, huge numbers of these GPUs. Um, and uh, in terms of processing, I think that we're talking about um, 10 to the 25 floating point uh, operations to train a, the, the big state-of-the-art models um, I mean that that is just it's a it's a number that doesn't really exist in um, in economics except during the worst cases of hyperinflation, and um, and and that's why you're seeing fifty billion dollar a year plus capexes in servers by the big cloud providers. But I want to let me just zoom back and say what have we actually seen with the economy's willingness to use computing? Um, there were less than a hundred computers in the world. Uh, in 1945, there are more than 25 billion today. Uh, so the economy pre-large language models and pre-AI had a, a really insatiable desire to, to put information processing throughout the economy in the center, in the edge, because what you're doing with, with information is um, actually it's a game of, it's a game of efficiency. You know, information makes processes efficient. It's a sort of analogous to learning by by doing, and and you know many of the the issues that we used to run into in the in the seventies when my dad was, um, you know, uh, working, and you'd have to look at stock levels, and stock levels had to be really high because you just didn't know what demand was going to be, and you didn't know when your supplier was going to supply. Well, with the arrival of IT and computers, we could better forecast demand and we could better predict supply and the amount of inventory that companies hold as dead capital has declined significantly. So the economy has has shown, uh, you know, for, an enormous appetite for the ability to process information. And we can really go back to 
you know, kipu in, in Peru, in, you know, South America and, and tally sticks um, before that to, to understand that. So then the question is, well, well, let's, let's be a bit more you know, discriminatory, discriminative and reductionist about where the sources of demand will come from. So AI is one. Another is um, each of us individually. You know, whether we like it or not, we upgrade our phones. A, a billion people plus don't have smartphones. Two billion don't have modern smartphones. Um, all of those will be will require upgrades. Um, and there are places where we don't yet have intelligence that will make really meaningful differences to um, how well people can live their lives. So we we don't necessarily have small edge-based computers in fields across farms in India and Africa and the United States, all of which will help in precision ag agriculture to improve agricultural yields, to reduce the use of pesticides and herbicides and, 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 and the like. So it's not clear that there is a point at which we have satisfied our need for uh, compute or the benefits that we get from compute. There will be particular applications where we don't need any more compute. I mean, I think a good example is uh, 8K resolution on monitors, which is already above what the human eye can discern. We might not ever need to go above, above that because that, we've satisfied that. But in other parts of the economy, I, I don't see there being a, um, a decline in in demand. And, and in that essay on the Substack, I mean, I did something very simple, which is I said, um, how much has compute grown globally uh, since 1971? I choose 71 because it's the Intel 4004 was released in that year. And it was roughly 65% per annum um, on a compounding basis, which of course gets you to a really big number. Uh, and by that, I was trying to count the number of computers and their rough processing power and you know multiply them together. It's a great... I'm not even sure, you know, let's make fun of economists. I'm not even sure economists would be happy with that uh, estimate. I know physicists certainly wouldn't be, but it's an estimate. Um, and, and, I, and all I did was just drew, I just drew that out. I said, it's probably safer for me to extrapolate this at 65% than it is to say the regime that has held for 60 years is going to change. Um, and that, that took me to a particular number. Um, but I, I'm really mindful of the fact that Five years ago, six years ago, I had conversations with people in AI companies and semiconductor companies, and they were saying to me they were expecting the demand for compute over the next decade, so that's five years ago, to increase by a factor of hundreds of thousands or millions of times. Um, and so I'm trying to put together both the history, the theory, some working hypothesis, and what people on the ground in industry tell me, um, and and it is a, it's, it's a sort of embarrassingly simple curve um, that points upwards. And even if I'm wrong by two orders of magnitude, uh, we're still talking about you know huge huge demand for compute in in thirty years. So let's uh, <clears throat> turn to AI in our in our recent survey. Uh, and I, I'll let listeners know that I hope to tell you the favorite episodes of 2023 in in a, in a week or so. Uh, but in that survey, I asked listeners to give me feedback. And one of the things many listeners said is they were sick of hearing about AI uh, <laughs> on my program, <clears throat> which shocked me. I, I thought it was so interesting. And uh, whether it was going to save our, our souls or destroy them uh, was an important question. And I thought we should spend some time on it. I think for some listeners, it was a little too much time. Uh, but I want to ask a different question of you, not, not this one of whether it's going to destroy us. So as you point out, uh, the number of, of users of, of AI, ChatGPT or others, you know, has crossed 100 million threshold remarkably quickly, a couple of mm -hmm. days. Right, that, something, something I'm talking something, about. Something absurd. But I'm one of those users, and I don't use it. I use it as a novelty item occasionally. I, I don't think to use it. It's not part of my daily workflow, and I'm trying to write. I don't think to start there. When I'm editing, I don't think to end there and get feedback from it. Maybe that day will come, but it has had virtually no impact on my life, except as the president of a college, we've had a number of conversations about what does this mean for our students uh, in submitting papers, in as they read books, will they be tempted to use it as a crutch? Mm -hmm. uh, should we regulate it, monitor it, and so on? And, and uh, I have a feeling I'm missing something, 
Mm. I have a feeling below the surface, uh, there's a lot of usage of it that I'm unaware of as either a user or a consumer of products where it's, it's, it's built into. So tell me where you think AI is going as a, uh, not as a destroyer of worlds or the mm. builder of paperclip factories, but as a uh, changer of our lives and, and in both in terms, in good and bad ways. I, I hear, um, and I recognize every word you've just said, Russ. Uh, that is, it is, you are not in the uncommon at all on this question of, well, you know, what does it do? Uh, you know, it's a sort of moment of, of now, now what? Uh, and, and I, and I think that it is not straight, uh, it's not straightforward. And when I talk to uh, companies, this technology is so general because it applies to language. And most of what we do is mediated by language. Uh, every use in a one in a firm is going to be different to every other use in, in, a, in another firm. Um, the way that I, I think about these large language models is through the framework of, uh, of compression, of, of time-space compression. And about the a force, it, it's not really a force of gravity, but it looks like that. It is about the way that our um, economy favors the compression of of, of information. Um, it took us, it took people in um, living either where you are or where I am, uh, thousands of years to to learn about New Zealand. You know, if you didn't live on New Zealand, you didn't learn about it until the 1770s. Um, it, it took the Prime Minister of England 13 days to learn about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Um, it takes me a second uh, to find out that Kim Kardashian uh, has got a new car. Um, and, and so what we're doing is we are, through these, these technologies, we are compressing this information space. Uh, and a large language model is the next representation of that compression. The one before was the internet, where on the internet, I could cross every library in the world very quickly um, through, this, through the search interface and learning how the library at your university works differently to the one at the London School of Economics. Um, and and what ha what's happened in LLMs is that we have effectively compressed all of the information on the internet, roughly, give or take, some, some isn't there, um, in a single space where our search system can cross all of that knowledge in a single go and present it back to us. So for me, while it is a, it's in some sense, it's a paradigm shift because it is a different regime. Um, uh, it, is, it is like steam rather than liquid water. It's still on a continuum of you know, the compress compression of the information radius of our, of our economy. Um, and so, so when I think about how one might, um, how it fits, I see that it fits in this, you know, in this historical trend. Um, and when we then uh, have to have to apply it, um, you know, it's not as straightforward as 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 that sort of you know model. Well, what would you do if I gave if it's if it's the year seven hundred before the common common era? And I gave you a fountain pen and a piece of paper. I mean, nearly all of humanity would have no idea what to do with that. They might lick the end of the fountain pen, and and I think that's where we are in, the, in in with with ChatGPT. Right, we're still trying to figure out how we use it. And there are some people like me, and there are people I know who are well, much more advanced than me, who have started to figure out the the the, the, the pattern of of use. I really use it like the graduate students that I don't have um, in my in my team. Uh, you know, the, the, where I, I can throw questions at, at them and I get pretty good answers. But I certainly wouldn't go off and present them in public without doing a lot of work, um, a lot of work myself. But but I think you know I, that it's going to have really really radical um, effects in ways that development economists in particular would would understand so for me it's it's about human capital in that context uh, you know human capital is both the marker of progress and prosperity but it's also the driver of progress and prosperity I was born in Zambia 
Zambia doesn't have many doctors per capita, not out of choice, but because there aren't many doctors per capita and so on. The cycle continues. Uh, what we'll be able to do, and I'm already seeing examples of this, is, is bootstrap human capital through specific LLM applications. And in the development context, I think that could be really, really powerful. And we saw the smartphone and just the basic mobile phone do that with, uh, you know, fishermen in, in Kerala and in India in the, in the, the, the turn of the century. And, and those experiences repeated time and again. So when I think about how AI um, will change the world, and I'm sure it will in, have positive impact in, in rich countries as well. But let's just for a moment look at what will happen in developing countries. I think what it can do is it can provide an injection of human capital and personal agency independent of rotten, the rotten institutions that normally surround these, these developing countries. Is it being used, <clears throat> if you know, do, do you know if it's being used in things that I'm consuming or using that I'm unaware of? Is it is it exploding in usage in products or in applications or websites that are making them more effective? Do we know that yet? Well, I think there will be, uh, you, we, you will have been exposed to it unwittingly by, um, you know, nefarious uh, actors. If you've received spam in the last few weeks, probably some of it came by that. I don't know yet whether the likes of Facebook and Google have outside of their specific AI-based products actually implemented this latest tranche of AI, AI systems. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not overly excited. Can I say I'm deeply unexcited by that prospect? I'm deeply unexcited by the prospect of even more persuasive advertising uh, flowing on my Instagram feed or uh, and so on, um, and persuading me to buy things that I don't really need. Um, and I think that that's a, you know, a really, really legitimate concern. Um, but where I spend my time um, when I'm looking at AI is at the, both at the, that development end that I've just described, and I've come across sort of interesting projects there, but also in the, in the scientific um, realm. So people are taking the same technology uh, as we see in chat GPT, and they're applying it to biological data, um, not just medical data, but biological data and protein data to build foundation models that can answer questions like, what would be a good protein that would have the following physical properties that, are, you know, for sake of argument, that could be used as a dye or as a, uh, a plastic replacement. Um, and, and those types of applications, I think, are really um, exciting because what, what they, you know, what, why, do we, why do we not have a good plastic alternative? By which I mean something that doesn't require fossil fuels, that doesn't leach into the environment, um, that isn't biodegradable. It's not because there isn't one. It's because we don't know how to build it. We don't know how to make a plastic alternative at scale for the right price. So any tool that helps us discover the, the phenomenal complexity of the information space of chemistry or biochemistry to help us find both that material and the mechanisms by which we could economically produce it has got to be something that we should, we should welcome, right? These are, these are real problems for which we know there exist in the physics solutions, but we just haven't f found them yet. So, so, so I think that, that those are the types of places where I'm looking at applications and I'm seeing teams um, and researchers starting to come out with applications in those fields, which you know, we can look back in a decade and say, oh yeah, that was the, that was the moment where, where we were able to make that breakthrough and we replaced this industrial process by, by one that was much more renewable and sustainable. Let's turn to the question of how we cope socially with, with the changes that we're talking about. And some of them, solar panels are pretty pretty great. Prices right. fall, gives you more money to spend on other things. It's a it's a pleasant we you know, there's a, it's a pleasant improvement. It when you look out over the rooftops of a city, it may not be as, as aesthetically pleasing as it used to be, but right. that's a small probably a small cost. Then I think about a technology like the smartphone, which, uh, you know, as you point out and others have pointed out, starting around 
a little about the turn of the millennium, but also the turn of the the 2010 period, the last 10 to 15 years, because of its uh, more common availability, has really changed daily life in all kinds of ways. And I remember sitting in a meeting, this is probably in the mid early mid-90s, um, was in a business school, there was a wealthy donor at the table at a meeting, and uh, his phone rang. His phone was... I had seen a cell phone at that point. I think at, at that point, I had a friend who had one. It looked like a walkie-talkie. It was a giant, <laughs> boxy, World War II walkie-talkie kind of thing. And um, when he walked down the street talking on it, he looked incredibly cool, even though now he would look like a total idiot. But right. when when this donor's phone rang, he took out his phone. In my mind, it was the, it was the size of a peanut. It, it was probably bigger than that, but it was shockingly small. He had whatever was the state of the art cell phone at the time, and in this middle of this meeting, uh, he may have even been talking. He snapped open this phone and started conducting a conversation. And I remember being both shocked, horrified, fascinated that he thought that was a socially acceptable thing to do. And of course, we have over the last ten, fifteen years, as cell phones become. Uh, both not only just more common, but the way we inter- interact with them has become more uh, addictive. Uh, you know, you see behavior in parties, dinner, meetings, which are radically different. And yeah. It's really rare that people say, let's all put away our cell phones and let's all pledge not to use it for the next hour, whatever it is. Um, so I would I would argue that we haven't adjusted our norms very much. Um, and if anything... We just continue to accelerate into isolation. That's what it feels like to me. Mm. That may be an old person's um, observation, but it feels like our so- the social acceptability of ignoring the people around you to devote yourself to uh, your screen has increased steadily, not exponentially, but mm-hmm. steadily. And then we get things like Vision Pro, which Apple released, right. uh, I think, last week, which make me even more horrified. You know, you're wearing these goggles. You look like, uh, you know, it's like a perpetual mask. Right. Your humanity, your eyes, your smile, or, or especially well, your really eyes, are obviously, are, are, right. are hidden from the people around you. You're interacting in, in these weird ways with maybe others elsewhere, but, but not the people around you. Uh, does this alarm you at all or excite you or... What are your thoughts on that? I have so many mixed feelings of alarm and excitement in in different measures. I think it's a really hard uh, question because, you know, historically, as technologies have have moved in, they they have changed the existing manifestation of power. Right, power has shifted from one group to to another, uh, and I think that that discussion about you know, which elite is losing out and who's the new elite when there's a technology change is a really important one to to have. It helps us frame where things are, are going. And we know that there's been a moral panic around many technologies. Uh, I've got, I have collections of stories of uh, from the New York Times, you know, girls are staying up late to read using electric light, uh, which is the thing that every parent would be desperate for today. Uh, but it was apparently going to, you know, sh- shock um, uh, and, and sort of ruin ruin society. Uh, but on the other hand, we have cases, and I think you know, Jonathan Haidt, uh, as an academic, has done a lot of work on this, on the ha- really kind of provably harmful effects of social media on on some groups. And then I think you've also talked about, you know, what happens to the the set of norms that we live by that have allowed us actually to to be to be human and these are really quite persistent you know they're persistent in our ancient stories they're persistent in the plays of Shakespeare uh, love and respect and anger and jealousy and all these things that happen in the the physical physical space and um, so so I, I I find it quite hard to pause through that noise and come out and say look I've got a I have a grand theory about what this what this looks like, but uh, but I'll, I'll I'll venture something, which is that, uh, you know, we we've we have um, uh, had a period of time where m- so, an increasing proportion of people 
have said the world is moving too quickly. Uh, and that some people were saying that in the 30s, right? And that proportion has risen and risen and risen. And what we were seeing was really subjective experience, right? That is valid from a subjective perspective, but it's not really uh, something that you could go off and measure. But I think there is a moment where that subjective experience could turn into something that becomes an objective reality, that the world does move too quickly. And in some sense, the modern economy does move too quickly. I'm sure you you remember the essay, uh, I Pencil, uh, and about spontaneous order. And even 70 years ago, no human could encapsulate and hold all the knowledge that was required to produce a simple graphite pencil in a, in a wood barrel. Uh, and, and, and so in some sense, we've always coexisted with systems that move, or we have in the last couple of hundred years, coexisted with systems that have moved much faster uh, th than us. And, and I think, and I, I want to say, Russ, that this is really just me thinking, and I, I wish I had deeper theory to, to, to back this up. Um, but I, I think that we are at a point where the pace of, of, of change and innovation is going to be objectively faster than even complex groups of humans can, can handle. I also think that a lot of that is going to be you know, desirable in a, in a very basic way in terms of energy security and energy equity and information to uh, access to information and, and, and welfare and, uh, and so on. So it, it'll be desirable in the same way that I do want my smartphone to always update itself for the latest security update you know, every week without my having to worry about it. And so I think then the question is, how do we, um, how do we govern a system like that beneficially for us as, as humans so that we can live at human scale and at human speed. Um, and, and that's what, what I'm thinking about at the moment. I'm trying to work through that question, which is, is, am I, have, is my problematization real? Does it make sense? And I'd love your opinion on that. And if it does make sense, you know, how do we, how do we think about human speed and human scale while taking the benefits of you know, the tremendous learning rates of technologies and, and an economic system that has information exchange at the heart of it. But does that framing make sense to you? I mean, you can t say, it. tell me it's total nonsense. Say it again, give me the punchline. So the framing is that we're at the moment, a, a point where the pace of change would become objectively too fast for humans, or it's a sort of silicon speed rather than biochemical speed. And so... The game is not for us to try to keep up with it, but it's for us to work out how to govern it and, and harness it so that we can live at a human sp scale and a human speed. I like that. I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure what it means, but I understand it. Even right. though I'm not sure what it means, I understand it. And I think, um, man, for some reason, this is what comes soon to my mind. I invite some friends over for dinner. I, I want to give you a couple images to, to yeah. chew on and you can you can respond. Um, imagine going to a dinner party, six to eight people are sitting around a table and you say, um, and you take out a book in the middle of dinner and you start reading. Right. And so I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just reading for uh, 30 or 40 seconds. I'm really enjoying this book I've been reading and I, I just wanted to read another page. And people would look at it like you're crazy. But of course, we People do that with they texts do that. and WhatsApp yeah. and other things all the time. I think of my father, when who was an, an introvert, a pretty um, d very much an introvert, and he would sometimes say after a dinner party, "I wanted to go upstairs and read my book," because he knew it was socially unacceptable to read your book in the middle of the dinner party. <laughs> so he would say, "I'm tired or I don't feel well," and he would go upstairs and read on his own, and that was socially acceptable. And now. Fast forward to the present. Uh, so I invite a group of people over for dinner, and they're all wearing Vision Pros. And and because, I mean, I don't even know what they do exactly yet. I right. have a vague idea. I tried one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I have a vague idea. You know, it's like saying, well, you know, I'm, I want to be at your dinner party, but I don't want to, I don't want to miss the latest score of the team I'm following in the NBA, or right. uh, I don't want to miss my notifications, or even more, a little more legitimately, perhaps, my kid's not feeling well, and they told me they'd text me if, if, if they needed a ride or whatever it was or some help. So everybody's wearing the, ma the mask, except me, because I haven't gotten into this world yet. 
So, you know, we could sit around and you could look mm-hmm. like uh, large insects wearing your masks. And I'd be sitting there like a old-fashioned human being. And we could, I guess, have a dinner party. But I think what would normally, what will normally happen is people will say, I want you to come over for dinner and leave your masks at home. Leave your vision pros at home if it becomes ubiquitous. You know, I keep the Jewish Sabbath. Right. When you have the Jewish Sabbath, you forego cell phones and vision pros and and other things for 25 hours. And you're guaranteed when you invite people over for lunch that they're not usually, if if they also are Sabbath observant, not always, but sometimes everyone at the table is, in which case they're not taking out their phones and you have a different kind of experience. You're guaranteed, some, you're guaranteed some conviviality. Exactly. Yeah. At a minimum. Right. Conviviality is 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 the minimum level. If you if at a high level you get a profound human connection, you might get uh, a, a deep feeling of of connection to other human beings that that raises up your your soul, whatever that means. But I I don't know how we're going to do that given how much fun they're probably going to be outside of a religious impulse where you feel compelled to yeah. to have a norm. So my worry. Um, and I, I, it's not a fear, I, I guess. It, it's a it's a concern. My concern is that my children and my children's children will uh, grow up in a world that it is less um, convivial. Would be a mm-hmm. nice a nice way to to think about it. And I really don't like regulation. Uh, like you, I think in your in, in parts of your book, at least you talk about. You know, norms will emerge that help us cope with these things. Institutions will emerge. Habits will emerge. Uh, but that, as I said, I don't feel like that's happened yet. You know, there there are there is a bit of a pendulum. There are people who are, you know, Jonathan hates an, an example of people who sounded an alarm. Uh, there are schools now right. that don't allow cell phones, uh, cell phone use among among uh, the students during the day. There may be some pushback against that. I, I would just recommend, you know, one last thing, and I'll let you react. Um, two things that come to mind. One is a book by Alan Watts. I think it's called The Wisdom of Insecurity. And this it was written, I think, in the 50s. Right. Uh, and then the second is an essay by uh, Mark Halperin, uh, one of my favorite living authors who uh, was a guest on this program. He wrote a magnificent essay called uh, I, I think it's called something like the acceleration of tranquility. I'm not sure, but it. Um, I'll, I think it's available on the internet, and I'll put a link up to it. And both of those essays, in different ways, were incredibly prescient about this trade-off of human speed versus um, uh, silicon speed, digital mm-hmm. speed, particle speed, and and how jarring it is for human beings to cope with it. In a way, it shouldn't be hard. I mean, what's the big deal if you find out more quickly that Abraham Lincoln died? If it's one, if it's ten seconds, thirty seconds instead of thirteen days, but it's because it's more than that. It's not just the compression; it's the volume. It's like it's like drinking from a fire hose. And I think I don't think human beings are good at drinking from a fire hose. So we need ways to either put the water over here where I can drink it from a container I'm used to or turn down the speed that the water's coming out of the hose or only go over to the hose when I'm in a certain frame of mind, I can handle it. Yeah. And I think we need to develop those institutions and norms, but I'm not sure we can. You know, temperance was such an important part of uh, what made culture successful. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a phrase, I think it's um, may, may come from the uh, the idea of the commitment device, that successful cultures and religions and communities have commitment devices uh, to to slow down our decision-making, your marriage being a sort of great example that gets enforced in many different ways, m- most of them you know, not non-economic. And you, there's a wonderful book by an uh, economic historian called Avner Offer called The Challenge of Affluence. And the book came out in about 2002 or 2003. But if you read the first couple of paragraphs um, or the first couple of chapters, you'll start, to, you'll think he's talking about Facebook. But he's not because Facebook arrives two years later. He's actually talking about the 
function of the modern economy, the intersection between uh, advertising, the way it generates desires and, and needs, and that sense of FOMO, um, and the effectiveness of aspects of the economy to to, to meet those. And, and so I, I, I think of this as a um, as something for which we've got you know, precedent, both in terms of the etiology, right? So what is it? What is the part pattern that, that has caused this? But also strategies that we have used collectively as humans in the past to uh, to address them. Um, you know, I think that the technical solutions are are helpful. I think it's more helpful that Apple phones have got the screen time control in them that allows you to put limits on. Um, I think it's also helpful that people have certainly with our, within my family we have many more conversations ab about this usage uh, but I think the way in which this ends up being uh, addressed is one that is around um, the, the, the norms and the behaviors that we uh, we establish uh, and we have to we have to fight to establish now I suspect again this is going to may end up being uh, something that divides around economic lines uh, because it's in the same way that every human needs 2,000 calories of food a day per dollar. It's cheaper to get carbohydrates than it is to get protein. So the poorer you are, the more carbs you have, and that's much worse for your endocrine system and your obesity and your outcomes. And the rich can afford their grass-fed steak, which is 20 times the price per per gram of uh, per per calorie. Um, and I, th I think this will end up dividing across economic lines because it will be much more expensive to have a an experience um, th that is about being with nature, disconnected, breathing fresh air, looking at dappled sun through leaves in person physically than it will be to do in your VR system. Um, and and you know, in, in some sense, much as I think about about change and the change in society. Uh, that is driven by technology. We've we've seen that 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 particular pattern play out before. Yeah, it, the funny part about it is that, as you point out, I also enjoy those old things about the dangers of books or the dangers of electric light or whatever it is. And we all we all laugh at it, and, and there is a worry that our anxiety about modern technology, current technology, is is as silly as as the worries of the past. Mm -hmm. The fundamental question is whether the, um, there's a point at which the frog gets boiled, right? It's one thing, that, you know, faster and faster, we're pretty good at, you know, the, you know, as you point out, the car changes a lot of things in our world, and it did. You can debate whether, you know, suburbs are anti-human. Some people think they are, but we've coped pretty well with the car. You could debate it. But the cell phone seems to be uh, a ratcheting up of, of um, it's not just quantity, it's quality of, of mm -hmm. how things have changed. And that, that's going to be, you know, I hope I stay alive long enough to watch how it turns out because, uh, you know, as you would, I think, agree, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think we have, um, uh, we're at the end of the, the, the story. And the, the question, I, th I suppose, is what is different about the the smartphone and the you know information system that um, that that it sits on top of to the car in the suburb and and the fridge and the air conditioning unit and there are a few things that I think are um, you know are, are different. One is that the system of incentives has been honed to the utmost extreme. Um, and and that being engagement, uh, yeah. and years ago, more than a decade ago, I was a product manager on sort of internet uh, uh, apps um, with some s small companies, and one of the things that you had to do was increase engagement um, for your users because engagement was the way in which you got to a profitable customer, and that was how you built the business, um, and and that um, you know I think that particular characteristic. Uh, is lies at the heart of what makes cell phones um, or smartphones problematic, um, and it's quite interesting, uh, you know, that that Apple, who you know has the majority of the profits in the cell in the smartphone industry, 
doesn't really benefit by the amount of time that we spend staring at it because right. they've got a different business model. They sell yeah. the phone and 20% you know, of their revenue is services. Um, and so, so that feels to me like it's more of a, 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 a pro, a, an addressable problem. Um, and it can be addressed by, uh, it can be addressed by, by, you know, interventions or civil society. Um, it can be addressed by, you know, parents being, you know, more aware and alert uh, uh, to, to the risks. But even that's a very leaky sieve. And, and, you know, we've known about healthy eating for a long time. We've known about obesity and so on for a long time. And it's very difficult for people to take those, make those changes. Um, and so, so, so when, I, when I look at a question like this, uh, you know, it is, it is a many-headed um, it's a many-headed problem. Uh, in a way, it, there's, it, it feels a little bit like the, you know, the, the, the climate change question, uh, which is we can agree to offset our flights and we can agree let's not eat meat and let's eat, you know, pulses and beans and, and, and so on. But it, it just doesn't make a difference um, un, unless we are able to, infect other people in large numbers to do the same. So we create a cascade because you and I look like pretty cool guys. And I think whatever we do, our friends will do. Um, uh, or it, it requires incentives from the state or it requires economics to just change the decision. I mean, the beauty of our discussion about solar is you, it doesn't matter what you believe about solar versus coal. If you're a rational economic actor, you'll buy the cheaper thing, which will end up at some point being solar and batteries. So, so I, I mean, I look at this particular question and I think we're not going to, it's not going to get solved easily. I felt about the Vision Pro that it was a really un-Apple product because Apple has never built products which demand the user spend loads of time on them. The, the things we spend time on on our iPhones are not Apple products. It's a meta product or it's TikTok or it's Amazon. And the Vision Pro is, is really an inversion of that. It is all about spending as much time as you, 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 know, you can in it. And, and that it, you know, did, did worry me a little bit. Um, but then how we tackle that Russ, I think is a really tricky one, and, and it may require it may require the threat of the government to not not necessarily come in and legislate, but to threaten to legislate for the companies you know within the fold who are driving a lot of the behaviours to say we're going to behave differently because we actually don't want these regulations, whatever they happen to be, uh, you know, cu coming in. Um, and that's not about the moral panic. That's not the idea of the moral panic. As somebody who does use Instagram to, you know, unwind, I also know there are limits, and I and I could live, I could absolutely live without it in a way that I couldn't live without my, you know, my LLM or my smartphone uh, today. Uh, so, so I, I, I can imagine that in order to to tackle this, it's going to require, you know, more than just hoping that parents get educated. Um, in, in this process. I mean, I, I just think our track record of parental education um, pales into, into insignificance compared to just fluoridating the municipal water, right? That was just, that was kind of easy, right? My guest today has been Azim Azhar. Azim, thank you for being part of Econ Talk. I loved it, Russ. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.